Subscribers to The Australian hear episodes first and get access to all Shari's work on this topic, as well as unrivaled news, politics, investigations, sport and culture. Go to theaustralian.com.au slash Wuhan to find out more. I'm Shari Markson, and I've spent most of the past two years investigating the origins of COVID-19. 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 The Chinese city of Wuhan is under quarantine as the outbreak of the coronavirus worsens. The federal government has raised its travel advice for the Chinese provinces to Wuhan and Huabei to level four. This is the front line of the epidemic in Wuhan, and it is bleak. I'm declaring a public health emergency of international concern over the global outbreak of novel coronavirus. What really happened in Wuhan? There's there's a chance that this is created in a lab. There's an investigation. A chance? Then they ask those scientists, they're like, how did this... So wait a minute, you work at the Wuhan... Respiratory coronavirus lab. How did this happen? And they're like, mm, a pangolin kissed a turtle. That was John Stewart and Stephen Colbert in June 2021. Millions around the world watched it, loved it, and laughed, including me. A year earlier, a very similar point, although not quite as funny, was being made by an Australian scientist. An Australian scientist says it's possible coronavirus originated in a laboratory after a study revealed COVID-19 was uniquely adapted for transmission to humans. Professor Nikolai Petrovsky from Flinders University is open to the possibility that the virus may have been a cell culture experiment gone wrong. Your understanding about the origins of COVID-19 will be challenged by a leading Australian scientist. Professor Nikolai Petrovsky from Flinders University in Adelaide and it delves into the origins of the coronavirus virus and exactly how the pandemic started. In May 2020, while researching the origins of COVID-19, I found myself reading a new scientific paper written by a vaccine developer who questioned the scientific consensus that it must have had a natural origin. I was really surprised to find the authors were Australian, like me. One of them is Flinders University professor Nikolai Petrovsky, a scientist of 35 years. He'd led the world in developing 10 vaccines over the past two decades for Ebola, avian influenza, Japanese encephalitis, West Nile virus, African horse fever, and even against SARS and MERS coronaviruses. His paper was a huge break from what had become established as the scientific community's dogma on the origin of COVID-19. I instantly tapped out an email to him asking if he'd do an interview with me for my program on Sky News Australia. He agreed immediately. Given the hostile climate for anyone to even speculate about the origin of the virus, I was taken aback at his courage. He'd shied away from approaches from major US television networks, including Fox News, and luckily for me, this meant I had the world exclusive. But even I was stunned by the strength of his interview. Recombination event in an animal host, or it could have occurred in a cell culture, you know, um, experiment. Nikolai and I would go on to speak many, many times in the next year and a half. It hasn't been easy for him to speak up, but he's driven by a strong belief that scientists must pursue the truth no matter what, and even if it's politically inconvenient. Nikolai Petrovsky, when did you start looking at the origins of COVID-19? So we started looking at COVID-19 back in early January of 2020, you know, when the, the very first reports appeared on social media that something was happening in China. And of course, being interested in pandemics and, and having been developing pandemic vaccines for 20 years, you sort of, you sniff obviously pandemics in their early stages. So, you know, I went online and was desperately digging for information to find out just what was happening in China. And of course, you know, rapidly realized this was a a massive threat. 
and uh, put everything in, in train to start developing a vaccine and, and trying to understand this new virus for which we had no information, just trying to piece things together from things like the gene sequence without even being able to handle the virus. So, you know, it was a challenging time, but, you know, it was a very fast learning curve. And when you started looking at this, did you have any reason to believe that this would be anything other than a virus of a natural origin? So, of course, you know, because we've worked with so many different pandemic viruses in the past, um, you know, from swine flu pandemic in 2009, um, you know, the SARS outbreak in 2003, the MERS outbreak in 2000, all of these came across naturally from, from animals uh, to humans. So, of course, our presumption right at that, you know, initial starting point was you know, this is a, a new animal virus that's crossed over to humans for the first time. And it, it wasn't for some time before, you know, we, we, we started to sort of move from that position because the data just wasn't adding up. And what was it that made you think at the, you know, for the very first time that this might be a virus that didn't have a natural origin that might have come from a laboratory? So there were a number of things and they all happened at, I guess, around the same time. So it was this sort of avalanche of contradictory data that didn't quite fit uh, with a natural an animal transmission. One of those was that, you know, we'd been building computer models using supercomputers to try and understand the behaviour of this virus. And, and when we ran the simulations, and, and at, at that point, we were assuming it was an animal that it, it had come from. And therefore, we were starting to try and work out which animal, because that was the big question back in January and February. Everyone around the world assumed it had come from an animal, but we didn't know what animal. So uh, our research at that point was just trying to look, using our supercomputers, well, what, what animal was it? We, we know it's an animal. Um, and, and I guess the first surprising result uh, that we found that really stumped us for a while was there was no animal, that humans actually, the virus was best adapted from those very earlier strains of the virus to infect human cells. And we couldn't find an animal uh, that actually sat above humans from which this virus was likely to have arisen. And of course that you know, was not what we're expecting when we did the research. And so we had to rethink, well, maybe the reason for that is our assumption was wrong. You know, maybe this didn't come naturally from an animal. And that opened, obviously, Pandora's box, because then we had to start saying, well, if it didn't come from an animal, where did it come from? And of course, that that led into, to, I guess, exploration of other possibilities. And, and one of those, of course, was that could this have potentially have come, you know, from a laboratory? Maybe there'd been some form of human intervention that played a role in this virus. And of course, at the same time, we'd sort of were starting to explore those questions. You know, other people, scientists, had been looking at just where the, the virus had started uh, in Wuhan and had sort of made the link that this was just kilometres away from some of the, the leading institutions in the world who were studying just these types of viruses. So, so it was our findings, that finding, and then a finding we and others made that the actual virus itself had unusual genetic features, particularly the furin cleavage site that everyone's talked about, that wasn't easy to explain. Yes, it can be explained if you say this virus recombined with another virus in nature. Neither of those viruses that are postulated have been found, but maybe this was the progeny of two viruses we don't know about. Of course, that makes it a lot less likely, but there, it is possible that furin cleavage site could be natural, but equally possible, we knew that scientists, particularly in China, were putting furin cleavage site into similar coronaviruses. So it's a natural question, and I think an innocent question, you know, did someone put this furin cleavage site into this particular virus? If so, how did that happen? Where did it happen? What was the rationale for that? Of course, we don't know it did happen, but you have to ask the question. Professor, when you ran those simulations and 
you saw that there was no animal that was perfectly adapted to this virus and yet humans were perfectly adapted, what was your reaction? Well, you know, I, I, I think I issued an explicative, um, you know, and it was a bit of a sinking feeling because, you know, you, you rapidly go from it, it wasn't an animal, you know, the alternative, suddenly you realise you're, you're going down a rabbit hole um, and there are all sorts of implications, not just implications for how did this virus start, but personal implications, you know, you know, if I start asking the wrong questions, you know, what's going to happen to my research group? What's going to happen to our research? What's going to happen to our credibility? Uh, are we going to be attacked from somewhere for, for not, you know, uh, I guess uh, going along with the consensus view that, you know, this must be a natural virus because this must be a natural virus because at the time you, when you look, there was no evidence to support this being a natural virus. So it was a presumption for which there was actually no real scientific basis, but we were going very much against that presumption, just saying, I don't think we can go that far. I think we have to leave all options open. You know, we were trying to be open-minded. We weren't in any way saying, you know, our research says this is a, a lab leak, uh, you know, scenario. It was our research sort of, is hard to explain, but one explanation could be the possibility of a lab leak. Surely we must leave that question open, but we knew in doing so uh, there was a big risk that we were taking in, in actually making that public. Did you weigh up whether you even wanted to pursue this rabbit hole with all the risks for your career? Well, you know, as you know, Shari, I mean, I believe science, you know, um, is, is about integrity and honesty. And really that's the only reason to do science. Um, you know, it's a, it's a hard road. Uh, it's very challenging. You know, you go from, you know, grant to grant, you know, there's no security uh, and it's very long hours. So the only reason you pursue science is if you're passionate about the importance of, of truth and facts. And so even although, yes, personally, I knew that this could have negative consequences, not just on me, but my whole research group and potentially, you know, even the university and, and the organisations I was associated with. I just couldn't see an ability to sort of ignore, you know, 40 years of training as a scientist to say, well, you know, uh, the facts aren't important. You know, politics and self-preservation is more important. It just didn't gel with me as a person. So regardless of the consequences, I thought, well, I, I have to say something. And, you know, I think my colleagues equally were, because I had to also involve them and they were equally quite concerned about how we position this um, and, and the implications. But equally, I think ultimately all agreed science is about the truth. And, and therefore we, we had to go, we sort of, it wasn't that we really were, wanted to go down this path, but we didn't see we had a choice. And thank goodness you did go down it because it had such an enormous reaction when your research was eventually published. That was a hard road though. What was the reaction when you first submitted your paper to medical journals and other scientific publications? So, you know, we were quite naive, I think, last year, because having done our, our research and, and, and found this really interesting finding that the virus was extremely well adapted uh, to bind to human receptors, you know, we thought scientists around the world would equally get excited. And, you know, everyone obviously uh, was publishing, uh, you know, work on this virus in very high level journals because there was a vacuum. We thought, you know, this could be an opportunity to really get a high level uh, publication and, and find out what people think about it. And, and we thought the, the, the scientific journals, particularly the leading ones, would, would actually jump on this paper because it, they like to have papers that are very topical, that are going to get a lot of media attention. Uh, and so we were quite stunned when we just got rejection after rejection after rejection 
without even the paper being looked at. So it was arriving on the journal's desk and within 24, 72 hours, it was just bouncing. So they weren't sending it out to other scientists to even get their opinion on it. They were going, this is a hot potato, let's bounce it out of this journal, um, you know, which, which was to us, you know, quite shocking, particularly when we realized it wasn't just one journal. It, it was all the leading journals seemed to be in the same camp where for one reason or another, um, they just weren't prepared to even give the paper a chance. Hey, Professor, this is censorship of science. Absolutely. And of course, the more this happened, the more indignant I and, 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 and my colleagues, you know, uh, who were authors of the paper became because, you know, again, science is is not about politics. It's not about you know, only finding nice things. It's it's about, you know, what is the truth? What are the facts? Um, and of course, the, the science is never perfect and, and people publish papers which sometimes turn out to be flawed or, or get rebutted. But the idea is you have to get that work out there and then let others attack it. So we thought that even if people weren't going to agree with us, that, you know, the, the way science should function is it should have actually made our paper public and then if people had found flaws in it and and been able to dismiss it so be it if they hadn't found flaws well then of course it would have stood the test of time which you know we hope that it will and in fact i think increasingly other people are now publishing very similar findings to what we found so really supporting that our work was credible you know from day one but it just wasn't politically you know um kosher for the scientific journals to to publish it which which again surprised us because we thought they were more open-minded uh it wasn't what we we experienced professor i think you'll be interested to know that i asked the head of the nature journal portfolio why they didn't publish your paper and others that questioned a natural origin of the virus and they came back to me and said that they would only publish scientific papers that were of the highest rigor, the top quality scientific research. And of course, when I then went back and asked, well, why was it that they had published what amounted to a piece of commentary in Nature Medicine by Christian Anderson and his colleagues? Well, they said that that was commentary. But, you know, clearly this is hypocrisy here. They were rejecting credible scientific research, but at the same time, publishing commentary or letters that promoted a natural origin of the virus in publications like The Lancet and Nature. Absolutely, Shari. So I think that if you look at what they did publish, they published a lot. Uh, not all of it was high quality. I mean, being completely frank, uh, because COVID was so topical that, that they were publishing everything they could get their hands on, providing that whatever the paper was they were publishing didn't sort of detract from the idea that this could only be uh, a virus with a natural origin. So as you say, clearly it, it, it's not entirely true what they're saying, that they only publish, you know, the very, very highest level of papers. And in fact, you know, today our publish has been, a paper has been published in a nature journal. Um, so it met all of their criteria ultimately, but it took over a year to reach that conclusion. Of course, by then the debate had changed and the politics had changed. Uh, and arguably the journals realized that if they kept censoring work in the way they had last year, they were going to be held to account by higher authorities and that could damage their business. So I think that, that, you know, really, I don't think our paper changed in any of that time. I think that the journals got to a point where they realised the attention was now swinging to just how credible are they as scientific publishers. And of course, once that, you know, uh, I guess question became open, you know, they, they realised there was going to be economic damage to them uh, if they persisted in, 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 you know, censorship of of the literature to support only one side of, of this scientific question. The censorship extended from the journals to the scientific community. 
Why do you think the scientific community as a whole was so reluctant to consider the proposition that the virus might have leaked from a lab? Look, I think there's a number of reasons why the scientific community sort of ended up all on one side of the ship, you know, universally only, you know, ascribing to this could only have a natural origin, although um, I think now things have moved back more to the centre. So I think the reasons why that happened, well, um, firstly, you know, there were these very early high profile, what looked like papers. <laughs> I think in retrospect, they were political commentaries um, and particularly, you know, the two, uh, I guess, most famous ones, you know, in, in Nature Medicine uh, by um, uh, Ed Holmes and in Lancet uh, by Peter Darzak. Um, you know, these are, are, are reasonably high profile people, uh, particularly in the virology world, uh, who came out with black and white statements, you know, this, we, you know, we put it, uh, hand on our heart, we can attest the, this can only be a natural cause and anyone who says otherwise, you know, basically should be shot or at, at, at the least uh, treated as a conspiracy theorist and locked up for the rest of their lives. Um, you know, that's pretty extreme perspective. And of course, most scientists who themselves were not investigating this virus thought, well, those guys wouldn't have taken such an extreme view unless it was unequivocally there could only be one answer to this question. Uh, and so the vast majority of scientists moved to that side only because they thought that was the only um, perspective, really. And, and, and they hadn't seen the other side because the publishers were obviously censoring any, any publication such as ours that might have raised a question. And it wasn't just people like Peter Daszak and Christian Anderson, Ralph Barrick, Edward Holmes. There were those prominent scientists. But then they were supported by the likes of Anthony Fauci, who also came out publicly the top advisor to the president on the coronavirus. And he said this had a natural origin as well. World leaders mostly supported this line of inquiry as well. And so this narrative took hold. Yeah, so I think that, you know, we also have to remember that if we look at the geopolitics of what was happening, you know, at the end of 2019 and the start of 2020, the US and, and China were, were in a, a trade war. Um, you know, Donald Trump came out early as the president uh, and said, you know, this is a virus, you know, is a China virus. Um, and implicated that he'd seen intelligence that this could potentially uh, have come from a laboratory leak rather than a natural cause. And, and of course, I think that that polarised the debate even further. Uh, you know, the vast majority of the scientific community, to be honest, tend to, to sit on towards the left of the political spectra. Um, and so, of course, you know, there was then this sort of, well, if we don't agree with, with President Trump, you know, we should, would, we should move to the other side and say what he's saying must be total garbage uh, because it's coming from the right. And so we saw the scientific community, particularly those on the left, go even further into the position, you know, that that's lunacy this could only have been a natural, it, more as a way of dismissing Trump and trying to bring down, because everyone knew we were going into a presidential election. So this was the one opportunity to make sure Trump didn't get a second term. So I think that was a strong element, including in the scientific community, because you have to remember, Donald Trump wasn't nice to scientists. Um, you know, a lot of his beliefs were not scientifically founded. Uh, and he had tried to strip a lot of money out of the, the National Institutes of Health, you know, research budget uh, within days of taking over the presidency. So, so you wouldn't uh, say that President Trump was loved in the corridors of the NIH, to be honest. Uh, and so not surprisingly, then, if they saw this as an opportunity to, to undermine, you know, President Trump and, and his views at the time, then, then, you know, why wouldn't they ascribe to the, the more extreme theory that, that this couldn't possibly be true? In terms of coronavirus research, 
what was going on in the Wuhan Institute of Virology? Well, so what we, we, we do know, I mean, is, is that they were one of the world's leading repository of uh, coronaviruses. So from uh, the time that, you know, we had SARS obviously come out of China, China, you know, decided to throw a lot of money uh, into coronavirus research because they were terrified uh, that there would be another uh, outbreak of, of a, 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 another coronavirus. And so they built the Wuhan Institute of Virology specifically as a BSL-4 lab, specifically to study, you know, coronaviruses from the wild uh, collected uh, throughout China and brought back uh, to that institute. So, so really, they, they are the epicenter of coronavirus research in the world, particularly the coronaviruses we're talking about, which are, you know, the coronaviruses found in animals, uh, particularly bats, uh, a, a smaller number in, in pangolins, uh, that they were collecting and bringing back to the institute to study. So, so I don't think anyone would dispute, you know, that's what they were doing and, and they were one of the world leaders uh, in, in undertaking that type of research. And Professor, there was one cave in particular that Shi Zheng Li and her team returned to over and over again. Yeah, like uh, anything when, you know, it's a bit like gold mining. If you find, you know, traces of gold, you know, you'll keep going back um, to try and find mine, you know, the, the, the major load, as they call it. Uh, clearly, if you're a coronavirus researcher who's re researching novel coronaviruses in bats um, and, and you find a, a particular cave, uh, that is, it seems to be a source of, of these types of coronaviruses, particularly coronaviruses that look a bit like uh, other dangerous coronaviruses, particularly SARS, um, then, then you're going to see that as, as the treasure load and, and keep going back, hoping to find, you know, those, uh, you know, uh, potential future threats that, you know, will, will obviously be important to humanity, but as a scientist would also make you famous. And th this cave uh, in the Yunnan province, the Mojang mine, an abandoned copper mine, they frequented that particular cave or abandoned mine shaft over and over again. And that's where they discovered the virus that, as far as we're aware, has the closest genetic similarity to SARS-CoV-2. What's the significance of RATG13 and why was it such a bombshell when Shi Zhengli mentioned it in her paper in early 2020? So I think this is a, just the most fascinating story, um, which is a mixture of, of obviously science, but, but it has all of this colour going back, you know, at, at least six to eight years. Um, that's all been pieced together, you know, not because it was disclosed, uh, you know, by the scientists involved, but has, seems to have all been pieced together by, you know, amateur detectives um, who got interested in this story. So um, the story of, of the mine's intriguing, one, because most of us only first learnt about it, uh, you know, in, in early 2020, uh, when the Wuhan... Institute of Virology said, we've gone to all the viruses, coronaviruses we've got stored in the lab um, to look to see, um, did we actually have COVID-19 in our repository? Uh, intriguing, um, but, but makes sense, you know, uh, because they had all of these collected samples. And then they said, uh, we didn't find, uh, you know, COVID-19, but hey, presto, we found um, you know, the very closest genetic relative to this, uh, which is rat G13. Here it is. Um, they didn't tell us really where rat G13 came from. Uh, they just put it forward as, well, um, this virus was found in bats and, uh, and it's the closest relative to COVID-19. Therefore, COVID-19 must have come from bats um, and, and therefore you know, we need more funding to go find more bat viruses. So that was all that they told us. And then it was slowly pieced together just what, where did rat 
G13 come from? And RAT G13 came from this mine that you mentioned. Uh, it was actually a sample that they collected many, many years ago from that mine. Just a few months after a, a group of, of workers had been sent to clear the bat droppings from, from the abandoned mine, uh, and three of them uh, had presented rapidly to hospital, very sick, um, and then another three, um, so six miners in all, uh, and, and three went on to die after a, a prolonged illness uh, that had all the features of a coronavirus infection. Um, and in fact, to this day, you know, having read the theses written by the Chinese doctors who looked after these patients, I mean, you, you read it and you say, this seems to be a perfect description of a patient dying of COVID-19. If that's the case, then, you know, what were they doing in the mine? Quite clearly, they were in the mine knowing these workers had developed what appeared to be a lethal coronavirus infection. They were there to try and find the virus that had caused that infection with the hope of, of them bringing it home to the Institute of Virology and studying it um, and making a big splash from it. It was just fascinating that they've tried to always disconnect RAT G13, the sequence, from RAT G13, the story of how they actually found it and the fact that it was so closely connected to human deaths of what appears to be an infection with what you might call the ancestor of COVID-19. And it's very hard to disconnect those two stories once you understand them, because then the natural question is, did they find COVID-19 on one of those trips? And if so, why haven't they told us about it? Um, or did they manipulate, uh, you know, RAT G13 or one of the other coronaviruses that they found in this cave and that created COVID-19? Of course, we can't know, but, you know, I, I, it, it's very hard, as I say, to just disconnect it. And we have to ask why weren't, didn't they disclose all of this information when they gave us the RAT G13 sequence? It's very unusual to give a, a virus sequence in a, in a very high profile paper and actually not tell anyone, oh, actually we found this when we're investigating what appeared to be human deaths from a, a, an outbreak that the Chinese never disclosed to the rest of the world, which again, you know, uh, is a concern because Maybe, you know, those miners did die of uh, a lethal coronavirus, you know, th that might cause the next pandemic. So why weren't we told about it? It does seem like it was a deliberate cover up by the Wuhan Institute of Virology to keep this story of the mine separate and hope no one would ever discover it. Look, yeah, I, I think that's right. I think, you know, it is clear that it was a deliberate uh, attempt to, to separate the two things. As to the reasons for why they were trying to deliberately disconnect the mine uh, from the, the publication last year, I mean, one would be um, a scientific reason, which is that it's a breach of scientific uh, ethics to actually republish data twice. And because they'd actually already published uh, a sequence of RAT G13 a few years ago, um, under a different name, um, then, uh, then obviously what they were doing is they were republishing data, pretending that it was a completely new finding, not connecting it uh, to the fact that this virus had been actually studied and published uh, a number of years ago. So that could be one reason is they were trying to, to basically, um, you know, cover up the fact that they were double publishing. The other conclusion, of course, would be they knew that, you know, there were links to that mine that would result in difficult questions being asked about the relationship between the dead miners, what was the virus that killed them, what were the viruses they got from the cave, and, and how might they all be connected to COVID-19. So I don't know the answer to that, but either way, it doesn't look good for the Wuhan Institute. Either, either they're breaching scientific, you know, integrity and ethics and, and deliberately double publishing work under different names, or there's an even more sinister implication. They know a lot more about 
these viruses from the cave and the miners and their connection to COVID-19 than they're currently telling us. Professor, what I find really intriguing is the first time they mentioned or published RATG13 under a different name. It was the partial RDRP segment that they published. And in fact, that has a 98% sequence identity to SARS-CoV-2. Yes, well, obviously, the you know the what they published and 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 you know the 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 Rat G thirteen are are one and the same virus, or or you know that's what they've now admitted. Um, obviously, other people have different interpretations of that, and they say Rat G thirteen has never been identified as a virus. Um, so again, you have to understand how viruses are discovered or, or sequenced. Um, and in fact, what, what happened when they created the RATG13 sequence, they didn't find a virus, grow the virus, um, and then sequence the virus, which is what you would normally do to describe a new virus. So what they did was that they took rat droppings that could have had many different viruses in, in that big collection of, of rat droppings, um, and then they, they, they basically sequenced lots of little bits of DNA in those bat droppings. And then uh, essentially like a jigsaw puzzle, you, you then put all of those little bits of DNA together and try and construct a picture. Uh, unfortunately, when you do that, there, there's, there's the chance that you'll create a Frankenstein that essentially you've got bits of different viruses and, and you're basically putting it together like a jigsaw puzzle and you end up going, oh, we think we've constructed a real virus. But in fact, what you've got is bits of different viruses that have all been spliced together. Um, that's the best fit. So, so there are, because they've said we never actually isolated RATG13 as a real live virus, um, that does raise questions about the provenance of even the RATG13 sequence, which, which they claim to be the closest relative to COVID-19. But again, it's complex science, but it all goes to credibility here. So, And I just want to add, I just want to add on that point, making this more suspicious is the fact that there's no evidence that virus isolate has ever existed in its current form as RATG13, because when Shi Zengli was asked about this virus, she said it had disintegrated. Yes, yeah, so so obviously the the story they've they've given when questioned is that they exhausted the the, the you know this bit of rat dropping that yielded this these pieces of DNA from it. Um, you know that they actually exhausted the sample. So you know now why wouldn't you go back to the mine and dig up another spade full of bat droppings. Um, you know, it, 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 if, if the bats in, in, in that mine are all carrying this virus, um, then there should be plenty of that virus that not only to be found, but that you could actually grow. So, so again, there are, there's so many questions, you know, if you could sit down and just, you know, I, I guess as a scientist to scientist, just explore this and say, look, there, there are all of these questions I have that I don't quite understand. I would love to get an answer to them, like a straight answer, you know, um, scientist to scientist. Why haven't you gone back there? Or, you know, if you exhausted that sample, why haven't you got more? You made a lot more trips to the mine. Why is it you've only found it in a couple of little bad droppings? Because, you know, if the bats in that mine have a virus, they'll transmit it to the, the thousands of other bats in that mine. So it's not that you can just have one bat living in isolation with a virus. It, it would have to be infecting them all, in which case all the droppings should be full of virus. And so, you, you know, you shouldn't run out of a sample and say, well, that's it. <laughs> I, again, they, 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 just scientifically, there's a lot of holes in the story that would be wonderful to fill but obviously we, we don't have that ability um, and the que answers that have been given to some of those questions raise more questions than they answer. Uh, and, and now, of course, it's, it's now in a situation where, you know, basically the answers are vetted 
by the Chinese Communist Party and they've disclosed that. The scientists are not allowed to freely comment on anything or provide any samples. It's all going through a very high level filter. So, so you know, we don't have those opportunities to ask innocent questions to find out, well, why do doesn't any of this quite make sense? You've analysed the scientific papers that have been published from the Wuhan Institute of Virology. How extensive was their genetic manipulation of coronaviruses? So I think that, you know, the Wuhan Institute of Virology wanted to be seen as a world leader in, in you know, genetic manipulation of coronaviruses. Um, that's very clear. You know, they set up collaborations with Ralph Barich and other, you know, leading uh, US investigators, you know, who were world famous uh, for actually, you know, inventing all of this type of genetic engineering of viruses. Um, so, so obviously over the last, I guess, six to eight years, uh, you know, Wuhan Institute of Virology publicly went all out uh, to, to get these techniques, to learn these techniques, particularly from the US labs, and to start applying them themselves, uh, you know, in their own labs, on their own projects, not just as collaborations, of which there were some, but clearly uh, they were also doing their own work. Uh, and, and, and we're trying to push the boundaries. Um, and of course, that always raises the question, well, how far did they push the boundaries? You know, what, what research were they doing? You know, because there's always the public research uh, that, you know, you're famous for or that is mainstream. But all scientists do research on the side, you know, that really cutting edge stuff that you don't want to talk about because either you want to scoop it and you don't want another scientist to come in and, and, and sort of claim they did it first, um, or because it's very high risk or, and, and, and you know, you, you basically, you know, don't want to talk about it till it's done. Um, and so, you know, what we know is publicly what they were publishing, that they were doing these genetic engineering techniques. We don't know how far that went, of course. And of course, some of it may even be confidential because, you know, it may have been done, you know, in connection, for instance, with, you know, um, you know, military groups or government groups, um, where you may not be even free to talk about it uh, because it's all un under confidentiality. So, so I think all we can talk about is what we know about them publicly wanting to use these engineering techniques and to become world leaders, and that means pushing boundaries. But just what boundaries were pushed and what viruses they were working on and what they did to those viruses, of course, we wouldn't know without being able to, to go into those labs and look at the lab books, you know, look at, at their approvals from the various ethics committees and animal welfare committees and biosafety committees, which they would have, that would minute, you know, the full extent of the research being undertaken. The, I mean, the virus database, of course, would be one thing that would be very helpful, for sure. What clues are there within SARS-CoV-2 itself, within its genetic code, that might give us a hint of its origins? So, you know, we know that um, SARS-CoV-2 um, is relatively, um, you know, has similarities to, to other coronaviruses. And, you know, we've heard about RAT G13 being arguably the closest, if you accept that RAT G13 is a real virus. Putting that aside, there are other confirmed viruses uh, that have been uh, uh, you know, um, isolated from bats, which are, uh, are clearly, you know, have been cloned and sequenced, which, which again have that same level of genetic similarity. So it does look like, you know, uh, COVID-19, you know, at some point did originate as a, as a bat virus that I think most people would accept uh, that as a premise. The question then is more about how did those changes occur that make it unique uh, and that make it so well adapted to humans, so well adapted that in fact COVID-19 can't infect bat cells, which again, for those who keep bringing up, you know, the possibility of a bat 
in in the wild markets in in Wuhan having been the source of COVID-19. Scientifically, that has has really no merit because, in fact, um, you know, this virus couldn't it can't, it can't infect, infect bats. bats. So so it couldn't have come straight across from a bat if it can't infect a bat. Yes. Um, and, and you would expect the opposite. Obviously, if it had come from a bat to a human in Wuhan around that time, it would have been exquisitely adapted to infect bats and poorly adapted to infect humans. So, And in fact, the reverse was the totally case. Totally the reverse is our research and now many other researchers have shown. So, so from that point of view, we know that at some point in history, it it was almost certainly a bat virus, but now it's a human virus that is that that doesn't have you know the ability to infect bats. So so then you say, well, there's only two paths really that could happen. It could have gone like SARS, uh, which you know the original SARS went from bats to civet cats, and then mutated in the civet cats and jumped across to humans and then became human adapted. Um, so, so that's when you know people like Christian Anderson talk about there must be an intermediary animal host somewhere. It's because you have to have that. If there isn't an intermediary animal out there that was carrying COVID-19, then it's inescapable. This could only have come from a lab, if that makes sense. So they have to postulate that intermediary uh, animal, um, but it hasn't been found. And, and so, of course, that means that it, it, it's, you know, there, there, there are multiple levels at, at, at which that um, side of the argument falters. So then when you say, well, what are the genetic elements that, you know, make this look or what make it such an exquisite human pathogen? Because you know, this, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's learning as it goes. It started as an exquisite human pathogen. If we look now at, at strains like the Delta strain, you know, it's, it's, it's going from bad to worse. I mean, and, and, and this is what happens when you have something that is already the perfect human pathogen. It won't stop there. It will go to an even better human pathogen because you, it's already, you know, has, has its foot in the door and, and it can only get better over time. And that's what we're seeing. And that's why, you know, it, it's been so scary um, is because it started with all of these advantages based on its genetic profile. You know, it was ideally adapted to infect human cells, to manipulate the engineering machinery inside human cells, to, to actually transmit from human to human, which is another capability altogether. It had all of that from day one. Now it's, it's getting additional sort of ammunition on top of that to go even faster between humans, to replicate at higher levels within humans, you know. Um, but that doesn't mean that it wasn't perfectly adapted to start with. So, so the question in terms of what, what is the genetic machinery that gives it those abilities, well, obviously the spike protein, you know, which we've worked on obviously um, from day one because it's also the protein that we're trying to target with our, our vaccines. But if you look at the, from the virus perspective, the spike protein is absolutely critical to its role as a human pathogen. If the spike protein was any different, it would probably you know, infect mice and it wouldn't infect humans. As it is, it infects humans, it doesn't infect mice. Why? Because the spike protein is exquisitely adapted to bind to human ACE2 receptors and it doesn't bind to mouse ACE2 receptors. It looks like that spike protein was taken from a pangolin. Yeah, so this is again where you start, you know, when you start asking, uh, you know, the, the, the non-orthodox question, like, so the minute you say maybe, you know, this didn't have a, a natural origin, you know, it had an unnatural origin, then you start looking for features that may be suggestive of an unnatural origin. And I guess apart from the furin cleavage site, um, you know, in, in COVID-19 that isn't in RAT-G13 or any of the 
closely related coronaviruses, so it's still inexplicable uh, based on evolution of viruses. Apart from that, the other intriguing finding was that the spike protein and the part of the spike protein that attaches to the human receptor so well is identical to the same part of the spike protein that was isolated in a pangolin coronavirus. So this is not COVID-19, this is a coronavirus that only affects pangolins that was isolated in China a, a number of years ago. And it looks like COVID-19 borrowed that spike protein out of this pangolin coronavirus to, to get this beautiful ability to infect human cells. And so again, you know, the, the people who are trying to pursue the, the natural origin uh, and explore that say, well, the only way, well, we must explain that because a whole lot of coronaviruses infected a smuggled pangolin um, and, and they mutated and they recombined in that one in a billion pangolin and that pangolin ended up in Wuhan for which there's no evidence and the pangolin coughed on someone in the Wuhan wet markets and that started the whole, uh, you know, cycle. Um, I mean, Nikolai, it reminds me of that John Stewart comedy clip where he said, you know, the pangolin kissed the turtle. I mean, you must have had this very unusual <laughs> circumstance where a pangolin somehow intermingled with a bat which is very unlikely, or this was done in a lab. Yeah, look, so, you know, certainly pangolins, are, you know, sit on the forest floor and they, um, you know, may end up um, in, in a bat cave, like amongst the droppings. Um, so, you know, it is possible that a, a pangolin could get infected by, you know, a bat coronavirus. Um, but, of course, you know, at the same time that, pangolin would have to be infected by a pangolin coronavirus. Um, so now you've taken a, a rare possibility because pangolins are an endangered species. So there simply aren't a lot of pangolins uh, around in China uh, because they've been hunted to extinction, uh, which is why they, they get smuggled in from Southeast Asia um, because, you know, they, their scales are considered a uh, uh, a natural, uh, you know, remedy, and and so they they prized um, for that reason. But it's illegal, in fact, to to trade in pangolins. Um, so again, you know, the idea an animal on the verge of extinction in China could stumble into a cave, get infected by a, a bat coronavirus at just the same time that they got infected by another pangolin with a pangolin coronavirus, those two viruses inside that one pangolin could create a third virus, which we now call COVID-19. That COVID-19 infected pangolin, which, you know, we only have postulating one pangolin in the wild, wanders into the middle of Wuhan and, and, and starts a pandemic. It, it's absurd. Uh, it's absurd. Um, uh, when you look at the opposite, well, so the Chinese scientists sequenced, you know, the pangolin uh, coronavirus from the smuggled pangolins a number of years ago. They identified the spike protein. We know they, because they published on it, that they found that the spike protein from the pangolin coronavirus was very good at binding to the ACE2 receptor on human cells. So you'd say, well, the natural next thing to do if you had another bat coronavirus in, in your freezer somewhere is you'd go, I wonder what happens if we put the pangolin spike protein, we know it's so good to bind into human receptor, what if we just splice that into, you know, one of the bat viruses in, in our freezer and we see, you know, could that now infect human cells. Like RATG13? Yeah, you could do it to RAG13 and put, you know, the, the bat pangolin uh, spike protein sequence into rat G13, or you could do it to any other of the thousands of bat coronaviruses that, you know, we've been told um, sit in the freezers in the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the sequences of which we don't know uh, because they haven't been made public and, and even the sequences they previously made public have, have obviously all been removed from, from access 
um, so they're no longer public. So, of course, it could be any coronavirus. It doesn't have to be Rat G13, but it would be a natural, innocent experiment to do, to put a pangolin coronavirus spike protein, which you know makes, the, you know, for a, a, a infection of human cells, to put that onto a bat virus, which you know doesn't infect human cells, to ask, well, what happens if, if, if we do that? You know, will the bat virus now infect human cells? And those are the type of experiments they were doing at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Absolutely. They, they were identical type of experiments they were doing and, and that they were so proud of and, and were, were publishing. And they were using humanized mice. That's how they did this. So they were using two systems. When, when you're trying to take bat viruses and see if they are infectious to humans, obviously you can't infect a human. <laughs> so, so what you do to, to, to determine that is you can put them in with human cells, which you're growing in, in a cell culture, and see does the virus infect the human cells. Um, or you can use monkey cells because, you know, the monkey cells express the same receptors pretty well as the human cells. So both of those cells are commonly used in places, uh, including the Wuhan Institute of Virology for their experiments. The, the other way you can do the experiment, particularly, you know, if you think you have uh, a very, you know, interesting virus that could become a human pathogen, is to use humanized mice where the mice express the human receptor, say human ACE2, in their lungs rather than the, the, the normal mouse receptor. Because now if you have a virus that will bind to human ACE2 and you put it in the lungs of those humanized mice, and we know this from, from the days of SARS, that virus will now kill the mice, even though the same virus, if you put it in a normal mouse, uh, the normal mouse wouldn't get sick at all because the virus actually can't infect a normal mouse's cells because it can't bind mouse ACE2, it can only bind human ACE2. So certainly having human ACE2 transgenic mice, um, you know, would make the natural sort of jump, oh, I, I put the pangolin spike onto this bat virus, I put it in with some human cells in culture, hey presto, it's now beautifully infecting those human cells. I wonder what happens now if I put that virus in the lungs of a, a, a humanized ACE2 mouse, you know, will it kill the mouse? And, and you know, those experiments were done, uh, you know, in China with the SARS virus and with the SARS-like uh, coronaviruses. Uh, and so it'd be a natural progression to do that with new bat vir coronaviruses. Let's say for a moment that they were doing these sort of experiments in the lab with humanized mice or with monkeys or monkey cells. You know, what are the possibilities for how such a highly infectious virus could have escaped from a lab accidentally? So what we have to remember is that once we've made a virus, um, you know, that infects um, human cells extremely well because we've engineered it that way, um, that actually becomes quite a threat to the people handling those samples because, you know, although people go into bat caves and, and, and we know the researchers of the Wuhan Institute of Virology went into bat caves with all these bat coronaviruses uh, without much in the way of protective gear and none of them, you know, got sick and, and dropped dead. Um, so because those bat viruses are not adapted to humans and so that gives you a layer of protection. But once you take such a virus and you now change that equation, so now it's highly infectious to humans because you've just manipulated a single protein uh, in that virus, of course now anyone in that lab handling those cultures you know, becomes at very high risk of an accidental infection uh, because all it takes is you know, a microscopic droplet um, in the air that you breathe in or, or even a, a virus particle on the outside of a vial and you touch it and then you touch your face to scratch you know, an itch. Um, and that's all it takes um, to infect you because you've actually made this virus so that it actually doesn't need much help uh, 
to cause, you know, to get inside your cells and to, to trigger off an infection. Given the extremely contagious nature of some of these new viruses that didn't exist in nature beforehand, many scientists over the years have called for this type of research involving uh, potential pandemic pathogens, others call it gain-of-function research, they've called for it to be banned. And the Obama administration, of course, did put a pause on gain-of-function research in 22 fields, including coronaviruses, from 2014. It was lifted under the Trump administration in 2017. Do you think this type of research should be allowed to go ahead? Do you think it should happen with U.S. funding in laboratories in China where we have no oversight? So I think that, you know, this is a, a very contentious issue because, the, you know, the first thing is different people define gain-of-function research differently. So it's very hard, you know, to say what is gain-of-function, what isn't gain-of-function. Um, and so in the broader interpretation, you'd say all virus research is, is in some way gain of function, you know, let's shut down all virus research. And that would be, you know, a disastrous position. And I think that also because of the threat of that happening is why vi virologists have all been very much, this could only be a natural origin um, because they don't want to see their field shut down. And, and they all know how disastrous that would be for humanity if we, we can't study viruses and develop, you know, cures for viruses um, because all such research is shut down. So, um, so I think we have to be very careful to, to if we are going to talk about, you know, putting regulations, additional regulations, because we already have enormous numbers of regulations on how we work with viruses in most countries. Not, not all, and that's again part of the problem is that, you know, if, if we put too many regulations on virus research in Australia, well, our virologists are going to move to a country that has less regulation, and that's not going to help Australia, um, nor the world. Um, so we have to be sure that we don't put any regulations unilaterally, like they did in the US, Guess what? A lot of that research moved to places like China or other countries that were were less stringent. Um, so, so it backfired. So I think you know the idea that you can just ban large bits of research, uh, particularly unilaterally in just one country, bad idea. So I want to really emphasise that before we go into well should we handle this differently in the future? And I think the answer is whatever we do, if we're going to regulate viral research, it has to be global and we have to get every country in the world one way or another to sign a treaty to say this standard is going to apply everywhere, not just here <laughs> uh, or in the US. Um, if, we, if we do that, then, then I think, you know, um, then, you know, virus research shouldn't be seen as a, a threat. Um, you know, again, we have to separate, you know, what's perceived to be a disastrous consequence, which we don't know how COVID-19 started, but if we, if we hypothesise it started with a lab leak, obviously it's been disastrous. You know, we want to reduce the risk of that happening in the future. But we also have to be careful we don't overreact to that because it, it you know, um, accidents will happen and, and, and we, we can't prevent accidents happening, we can minimise those risks. Uh, but we also have to look at the benefits and, and not throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I'm, I'm trying to sort of equivocate here because there is no easy answer. When people say just ban gain-of-function research, obviously that can't be done because you would need to ban it in every country of the world and police it in every country of the world. And currently that just isn't possible. So it doesn't make sense to, to as I say, just do it at a local level. Just in terms of how COVID-19, the virus that has ruined the world, upended livelihoods, taken millions of lives, does it behave in a more unusual way than other viruses we've seen, particularly the asymptomatic spread? 
and, and the long incubation period. So all, all viruses have their own unique um, features. So I, I don't know that we can say that, that COVID-19 stands out um, in any particular way other than, you know, it appeared to be particularly well human adapted from very early on. Um, other than that, it's followed the natural course of all viruses that have found their way one way or another into humans and are looking to exploit that opportunity. Um, so viruses are opportunists. Um, they find themselves in this wonderful new host um, and uh, of which there's billions. Um, and they're all moving around the world you know, at lightning speed, um, having close contact with each other, which you don't get with most other species. For instance, bats, they're living in a cave. A virus gets into that cave, but it can't infect every bat in the world because bats aren't getting on you know, jets and taking holidays and spreading the virus. So, so obviously any virus that gets into humans will exploit the opportunity. And, and that's why it's so terrifying if it, when Ebola gets into humans or SARS or MERS, all they need to do is learn a few little tricks. Uh, and the, the biggest trick of all is how to transmit from one human to another. Um, and once you learn how to do that really well, then the whole of humanity becomes your host species. The unusual thing about COVID-19, it had all of those tricks from what appears to be day one. That, that, that is the, the unusual feature. It had the trick to beautifully infect humans. It had the trick to beautifully transmit from human to human. Um, and as I say, to have all those tricks that are all very human specific, all in a single package, all at the very beginning, does, does raise questions, how, how did that happen? Professor, I'm not sure I want the answer to this, but given it was perfectly adapted to humans to begin with, and we're seeing increasingly more contagious variants like Delta, is this what the future looks like? So unfortunately, and I, I think I warned of this in January last year on, on LinkedIn, you know, pleading with everyone, you know, to, to lock down, you know, and stop this outbreak leaving China. And, and of course, unfortunately, the opposite was done, where people were encouraged to actually travel in and out of China to every other country in the world to make sure that, you know, every, every country got infected. Um, you know, uh, we've seen in Australia that, you know, if, if, if a lockdown had happened at a global level in January last year, there would be no COVID-19, just like there's no SARS. Um, it's that simple. A few weeks work and we wouldn't have had any of this. At this late stage, and again, as we predicted at the beginning of last year, if this virus is allowed to spread and disseminate, it's going to learn more tricks. Uh, it's going to become more infectious because that's the way viruses travel. Uh, they're opportunists. Uh, and it's going to get, reach a point where we'll never actually free ourselves because it's found we're such a wonderful host species, it doesn't ever want to leave. Uh, and I think we're now at that point where we have allowed it to adapt so, so much more even than it, it had at the beginning to humans that we're going to be living with this, you know, forever. Um, and uh, it, it's probable that you know, in one shape or other, COVID-19, like influenza, uh, is with us for the duration. Now, whether a vaccine, you know, can change that, we'll have to wait and see. But even if, if we, you know, and, and obviously we're working on one, even if we have an amazing vaccine that completely not just stops you getting really sick, but stops you getting infected, stops transmission, you know, we estimate it would take five to 10 years to immunize the world's whole population sufficiently that you might be able to break virus transmission, you know, as we've done for polio and smallpox in the past. But we have to remember those eradication campaigns stretched over decades before we finally got to a point where, you know, we, we can eradicate the virus. So, so you know, in the meantime, we, we, we are going to have to learn to live with COVID-19. 
um, and, and try and best protect ourselves against it, you know, as we've learned to live with influenza. So I, hopefully it will be no worse than influenza. Uh, obviously at the moment it still is. Um, it's, it's much more lethal than influenza. Um, if we get everyone vaccinated, hopefully the impact might be equivalent to influenza. Uh, but I, I do think we, you know, we, we have to accept it, it's just going to be another burden we had an opportunity in January 2020 to eradicate this virus out of the whole human population. For a whole lot of reasons, that opportunity was lost. And that's really sad uh, because, you know, in, in 50 years' time, our children's children, you know, might one day look back and say, why didn't, why didn't anyone stop this virus when you had the opportunity in that first few weeks? You know, why did people, you know, ignore the signals? Why did they listen to the Chinese propaganda that clearly was, was incorrect? You know, why, why did, you know, some politicians say, oh, just let it sweep through and, you know, it will be gone in a few months? Um, you know, we, we do need to, to look very closely at how this happened and not allow it to happen another time. Nikolai Petrovsky, thank you so, so much. That last answer, by the way, Nikolai, nearly made me cry. Our children's children. I can't imagine the thought that our grandkids, my grandkids, would still be dealing with this. It is so sad. And you think that the world, I literally am feeling teary. And you think that the World Health Organization advised against travel restrictions. I mean, it makes you furious. China objected to the travel restrictions that were put in in late January. At the same time as, as welding people into their apartment blocks. Yes, that's how nailing serious, people you know, into their homes, I, they knew. Yeah, and I think, you know, again, that's what people need to look at the, you know, the social media because there were people in China filming on their phones, you know, the army welding, you know, apartment doors in China so people couldn't leave their building. And at the same time, the Chinese government are officially, with WHO, putting out statements, this isn't a virus to be worried about, there's no human-to-human -human transmission. When in history have you seen people welding doors on buildings to stop the people leaving, like, and then saying, and then, and then saying, but, but, you know, yes, we shouldn't stop flights, we... You know, the Chinese and that's what made you warn on LinkedIn that we should go into lockdown because you could see what was happening yeah. in Wuhan. Yeah, and again, it was Chinese citizens who, who were streaming and, and then you had people saying that's all false imagery, you know, bodies being carried out of apartment blocks, you know, in stretches, you know, and, and this is in early January and, uh, and the Western media were already complicit, you know, not taking that line, but going the Chinese government line of, no, this isn't real. You know, this is not a serious outbreak. It clearly was devastating. And I think the underestimate of deaths in Wuhan, I mean, I think officially we, we now, I think, believe that there were at least 10 times the number of deaths that the Chinese ever disclosed. I mean, obviously, if the world had known those numbers and how many people were dying, and why the Chinese were reacting, you know, so vehemently sending the army in to Wuhan and locking everyone in their houses. This was no little outbreak, you know. It, it, it just stuns me. And, that, and, it, and, yeah. and there was even, there was even um, you know, accusations of racism when Trump shut down travel from China. I mean, Joe Biden himself sent a tweet calling it racism. I mean, it, it's extraordinary. Professor, a Chinese military scientist lodged a patent for a coronavirus vaccine, a COVID-19 vaccine in late February 2020. How? This was just five weeks after China had eventually confirmed there was human-to-human -human transmission of COVID-19. Is it possible for China to have developed a vaccine that quickly or does this indicate they might have been working on a COVID-19 vaccine prior to when they admitted to the WHO and the world that they had an outbreak? So, Sharia, you know, as, as a vaccine developer myself, I can tell you, you know, vaccine, uh, vaccines are not easy 
to develop and they, they do take considerable time, um, even once you have the genetic sequence of the virus and you understand the virus. Um, and, and so, yes, it, it does raise serious questions. And, and I have to say, um, you know, myself and others believe that, you know, the, the sequence of the virus that was released um, to the world, uh, in fact, uh, by Ed Holmes, uh, you know, with his Chinese collaborator uh, leaking it uh, in early January, because, you know, there was no indication the Chinese were ever going to release the sequence of this virus. Um, we don't necessarily believe that was the first sequence. Um, you know, I, I think to, to, for all the, the work the Chinese had done and the speed with which they did it, um, I still think it's likely that, you know, they obtained the sequence of this virus uh, in 2000 and late in 2019. I don't believe uh, the official story that the virus was first sequenced in, in late December of 2019. I, it, it, or there's every indication they had a few months lead time on the rest of the world in, in you know, knowing something about this virus, even if it had come from a natural origin. Um, so I think that that's a whole separate story of, you know, what information did the Chinese have on, on this virus and when? And in particular, when did they get the very first sequences uh, of this virus so they knew what they were dealing with. And of course, if they had that information in October, November, December, and, and didn't share that with the WHO and the rest of the world, well, well, certainly, you know, that would make them highly culpable. Thank you very, very much. Nikolai, you are so wonderful. I really enjoyed interviewing you as always, that we had a bit longer than the normal. So <laughs> thank you so much for that, appreciate it. It's a pleasure. What Really Happened in Wuhan is presented by The Australian. It's written and produced by me, Shari Markson, and The Australian's editorial director, Claire Harvey. It was produced by Liat Samaglu. My book, What Really Happened in Wuhan, is available online at Amazon, in bookstores in Australia at Dimox, or wherever you buy your books.